Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the two-hour chart of silver provided by netdania.com. Um, I've drawn in the trend channel here. As you know, we had the big rally on not significant volume until we got to right there on that breakout. But then we had significant volume come in, kind of creating this top. And we were looking at a breakout here, but we got a failure, smackdown, another smackdown. So we're still out of the trend channel. Let's put up the MACD. You can see that the MACD corrected down below the zero line is now starting to round off. So if we get a rally from here, which is, is possible with a lot of this volume coming in into the paper market, again, just, just paper, that's what we're going to be looking at here with the shortages in the Perth Mint article. But um, what what's my guess on this being a secondary bottom? Probably pretty good. Uh, do I think we're gonna get new lows on silver? We could, I'd say there's probably only about a 30% chance we're gonna break that 1440 low. But anything's possible. As I posted in a comment on Zero Hedge today, silver would have to go to, based on the premiums on uh, junk silver, which are now about $4.50 an ounce. Uh, silver would have to go down to $10 for uh, uh, us to get a new low price on junk. And that's assuming the premium doesn't expand. Because uh, for the longest time, junk silver has always traded at at or below spot. And now uh, junk silver is trading at about $4.50 above spot. So that's a big disconnect. That doesn't leave much room for lower prices, really. So let's look at the main article of the night, and this is going to be this um, silver shortage apologist uh, from the Perth Mint, and uh, his name is um, Braun Suchecki. And I wanted to dig in here to these articles that he's written. He's an, been an employee for the Perth Mint for uh, a long time. And he's trying to explain away the silver shortages, actually silver and gold, so he bounces back and forth. Uh, but let's start off with the article that was before the one we're gonna look at um, to uh, just get a little insight into his point of view. So there, this is a good article as well. This is called uh, Coin Shortage Facts, Telling a Real Shortage from a Capacity Shortage. And uh, this is the big argument that they use. They've been using this since 2008. There's a lot of ways they explain away why they don't make their own blanks, why they don't do this, why they don't do that. But I thought it was kind of interesting, uh, this explanation about price, because ultimately that's what we're going to be uh, looking at. Why don't you just raise the price? Uh, so let's get to that. Here it is. When mints run out of capacity, why do they ration production rather than increasing prices? That's a very good question. Um, because obviously, uh, if you want to cut down on the number of buyers, you can just raise the price and you can make more money. Uh, and so here's the explanation. It's kind of a mix between, well, it's not our, in our long-term interest and we're really just good guys. So let's read this. Most mints rely on a network of distributors to sell their coins. Uh, well, the first question you ask is why? Why do you do that? Why don't you just sell them to the public? Because the Perth Mint, you know, anytime you go to the Perth Mint, the only thing you can buy directly from them is these ridiculously overpriced numismatic coins. And I'm not talking about the semi-numies that we stack. I'm talking about ridiculously overpriced proof coins. And he says, these distributors are often long-term customers of the Mint who buy in volume. Rather than picking favorites or those with the biggest checkbook, Mint's ration to maintain fairness of supply across all their distributors. If one dealer cannot get any product, they may go out of business. Well, that doesn't answer the question. Uh, the question was, why don't you just raise the price? Now, raising the price doesn't discriminate against a, a large 
uh, doesn't discriminate in favor of a large purchaser against a smaller purchaser. Uh, it doesn't. It's not discriminatory at all. Raising the price just simply raises it on everyone. Uh, so that argument is completely bogus. That doesn't even make any sense. For those mints who also retail their bullion coins directly to the public, yes, they could make their long-term distributors compete at auction for their production with retail buyers. However, mints are at risk that when retail demand declines, and this is another argument he's going to use here, uh, which has is not happening. He says it's happening, that retail demand is declining, but it's not, which has often occurred in the past. Their long-term distributors will remember how the mint took advantage of them, and they will either take their business elsewhere or aggressively negotiate terms in retaliation. Seriously? Is this guy a communist? Uh, that's ridiculous. People hold grudges in markets for people raising prices. That's just stupid. I, I, don't even, I can't even believe he's making this argument. Uh, raising a price is not taking advantage of somebody. That's something that socialists and communists argue. Uh, and of course, with Perth Mint, uh, maybe he's talking about bars here. I don't know what he's talking about. But if he's talking about the collector coins, then there's no way you can take your business elsewhere. The Perth Mint is the only source of these coins. So based on past experience of fickleness of retail demand, mints often decide to continue to supply their long-term distributors on a rationing basis rather than a move to, to who pays the most wins. So that's just a stupid argument. Um, that doesn't even make any sense. Raising prices does not discriminate against any buyer except for those who don't want to pay higher prices. Uh, I don't even know what he's talking about. But let's look at the main article. This is called Demand Price Disconnect. And, and we can look into Brian Shuchecki. And it's kind of interesting when we look into him. We'll just go into this real quickly here. Uh, he's been working for the Perth Mint for quite some time. Uh, but when we go into his about statement, I'm not seeing that here. Um, and I'm not really not going to waste any more time on it. But basically, in his about statement, he talks about how uh, he's uh, warning people against people who talk about shortages. They're really just trying to take your money. And uh, he, he's out. He's he's looking out for the the little guy. And it's really just a lot of kind of political. Um, he doesn't really seem like a stacker. And this, it kind of gives me a uh, feeling, uh, if you remember John Nadler, Nadler, um, I think he was with Kitco for the longest time. Of course, Kitco uh, went through a, a bankruptcy and criminal investigation. And uh, this is a guy who works for um, a mint and whose product is, is silver and gold, and yet he's always discouraging people from buying it. So if you go to that about statement and you look at uh, Braun, Braun is telling you he wants to give you both sides of the story. Um, why is he so interested in making sure that people, you know, have all the facts and aren't deceived about silver and gold? It's kind of strange to see somebody in a business of selling something kind of fighting against that business. So that's the kind of flavor that I got when I looked at his about statement, but go ahead and look into that. So let's get into this article here. Last week, I explained why shortages occur and how they are generally caused by production capacity shortages. Often shortages, such shortages of retail coin products are spun by commentators into a shortage of raw gold or silver or physical paper disconnect, and thus a sure sign that metal prices will rise. Well, no, that's not what they're arguing. They're not arguing that uh, that metal prices will necessarily rise. It's just an indication that you don't have an honest market. Ultimately, I think most of us believe prices are going to explode because there's an underlying fraud here. But uh, until the fraud's exposed, that doesn't mean metal prices are going to rise. Certainly doesn't mean that paper metal prices are going to rise. Mike Shedlock in his very direct style, who is a guy I honestly don't trust as far as I can throw him. He's a deflationist. 
the anytime you see articles promoting the difference between physical gold and paper gold, you're most likely reading a pile of crap. Referring to the fact that one can get physical gold near spot rather easily and giving examples of gold money and bit gold. Well, that's kind of interesting because you're not getting physical gold with gold money. You're getting a promise that someone else is getting physical gold and storing it for you. And bit gold, you're not getting physical gold either. So I, I'm not really sure what he's talking about. Mike's comments were in response to this article that argued that because demand for physical metal is very high, yet the prices of bullion in the futures market have consistently fallen during the entire period, the only possible explanation is manipulation. Market manipulation is certainly a factor, but claiming it is the only possible explanation is like is taking a limited view of the dynamics involved. So he's admitting that it's a factor. Strange. The authors start by claiming that for four years, the price of bullion has been falling in the futures market despite rising demand for possession of the physical metal. As proof, they mention prior periods of coin shortages. While there have been periods of resurgent demand, the fact is that retail bullion dealers have had a tough time since gold prices peaked and many have scaled back the size of their business. One would not see bullion dealer bankruptcies like Tulving or Bullion Direct in a market with rising demand. I'd argue that scaling back of inventories as demand waned was probably a contributing factor in the recent shortages. Okay, do you see what he's doing here? He's connecting Tulving and Bullion Direct with what he says is a scaling back of demand. Now, we've already looked at Tulving and Bullion Direct. We know that for whatever reason, they got into trouble, most likely uh, with Tulving, it was a hedging issue uh, that he wasn't properly hedged in his buying in 2011. Bullion Direct, uh, maybe something similar, we don't know, but a sort of Ponzi scheme, kind of selling things you don't have, taking the money and then pushing things off into the future. But his argument here is that demand has waned. now. I don't know how he can argue that demand is waned. Here's a chart of American Silver Eagle sales, 1987 through 2015. Now, we're going to talk about a Giffen good here because that's going to be a very important discussion that he gets to and uh, whether the demand for something rises as the price rises. But... Uh, how anyone could honestly argue that demand has waned, uh, that's absurd. Maybe he's talking about demand for paper. Maybe he's talking about investment demand that's not real silver. Um, I'm not sure what he's talking about, but there's no way you can honestly argue that demand has waned. The authors also argue the rest of the gold market, certainly Chinese demand and he he's mainly talking about gold but uh, I'm mainly talking about silver he does bounce back and forth so it's hard to keep the argument straight certainly silver is the most manipulated but gold is also very manipulated certainly Chinese demand has provided a base but Indian demand was affected during the last four years with their government's raising of duty levels we have also lost demand that came from the ETS now that's an assumption we don't know if there's any demand from the ETFs because we don't know if the ETFs have any metal, which has swung from a net of 1,407 tons, 15 quarters from quarter one of 2008 to quarter three minus 712 tons in the subsequent 15 quarters, a change over uh, 2,100 tons in the supply demand balance. Now this is, again, here's a guy who can't distinguish paper from metal. And we're going to see that again in the most important argument here where he just utterly destroys himself. So let's continue on here. After going over supply and demand curves 101, they then argue that it is nonsensical to argue that a drop in precious metal prices unleashed a surge in global demand for coins because price is not a determinant of demand, but a quantity demanded. A lower price does not shift the demand curve. Moreover, if demand increases, price goes up, not down. This view ignores the fact, f feedback nature that price has upon demand. Most certainly price shifts the demand curve. 
people adjust their personal demand curves over time and price is one input into that. The Perth Mint has a lot of clients who bought gold at around $300 an ounce and I'm sure in 1999 if asked that they probably would have agreed they'd sell when it got to $1,000. However, many did not and held on because the trend upwards in the price made them revise their perceptions of what was a fair price. The authors also assume that gold has a normal demand curve. That is, if price goes up, then quantity demanded will go down. However, as Paul Milchrist asks in this article, maybe gold is a Giffen good where quantity demanded goes up when the price goes up. Ted Butler makes a similar observation in this article, noting that managed money technical traders buying on rising prices and selling on declining prices, looking at a graph of retail and bar coin demand as reported by the World Gold Council versus price seems to lend weight to the Giffen Good argument. So let's look real quick here at the Giffen Good. We've We've covered this before. Let's read the definition real quick. In economics and consumer theory, a Giffen good is a product that people consume more of as the price rises, violating the law of demand. For any good as the price of the good rises, the substitution effect makes consumers purchase less of it and more of substitute goods for most goods. The income effect due to the effective decline in available income due to more being spent on existing units of this good reinforces this decline in demand for the good. But a given good is so strongly an inferior good being more in demand at lower income that this contrary income effect more than offsets the substitution effect and the net effect of the goods price. Uh, the goods price rise is to increase demand for it. Uh, wh what does all this mean? Well, it's a whole bunch of nonsense. Um, as you can see down here, when they try to find a empirical examples, empirical evidence, they can't find any. They're, uh, they've always proposed examples of, of a good uh, that as the price rises, demand rises, but every single example they've tried to find fails because it violates the law of supply and demand. So it doesn't exist. It's nonsense. So how is it that silver and gold can be given, given goods? Well, because they're not, they're not goods. Uh, their money. So the whole analysis is flawed because it's only t this is a, an analysis of the prices of commodities, supply and demand for commodities. That has nothing to do with supply and demand for investments. People invest in assets because they believe the price will rise. People don't buy coffee because they believe the price will rise. People buy coffee because they consume coffee. So to take a consumer good or a commodity that is consumed and compare it with gold that's never consumed or silver that is unfortunately consumed mostly but is also bought for investment reasons is just plain stupid. Uh, that's ridiculous to even talk about the Giffen good argument when you're talking about gold and silver. Gold and silver are money. And secondarily, they are investments when you're talking about coming from a paper system, uh, they are ways of protecting your assets. So uh, when they rise in value, that's an indication of a vote of n no confidence in the existing authority. So you can imagine that if large numbers of people begin to vote no confidence in the power of the existing authority to maintain uh, security and income and a stable society, etc., then Yes, of course, uh, other people will begin to notice that and they decide to protect themselves. Uh, it's not, nothing different than people fleeing a, a theater or people getting off a ship when it's sinking. Um, they're going to watch what other people do and they're going to follow. Now, the other thing is with a, a Giffen good and why financial assets or th that being stocks, bonds, but gold and silver as well, investments, are not Giffen goods is because... Uh, people are buying something because it goes up. All technical traders are trading based on uh, the either a price rise or a price fall. Sorry about the uh, ambulance there. Um, so when you're trying to make a profit as a technical trader, you're trying to predict that uh, the direction of price. Now, I've shown you many times in the past 
with Jesse Livermore, we'll just use the silver market as, ex as an example. Uh, when we were looking at this series of ascending uh, flag formations, uh, as Jesse Livermore's least resistance argument works, and that's minus manipulation. Uh, one of the telltale signs of a winner in a bull market is this uh, price rise. So obviously people are going to buy an asset because the price rises. It has nothing to do with it being a Giffen good because gold and silver aren't Giffen goods. They're not goods at all. They're investments. And that's where his analysis completely falls apart. Now, I wanted to uh, concentrate on the most important paragraph in this article. And that just shows you the complete misunderstanding. I'm not going to say the guy's corrupt or he's a deceiver or a liar or a paid shell, but just to show you the complete misunderstanding of what we're talking about here, I wanted to explore this comment that he makes about naked shorting. So we'll start here. The authors then refer to futures market speculators and manipulations. Certainly gold's low liquidity allows for manipulative events which can market sentiment in the short term. However, this is not enough to suppress the price over the long term or for years where market fund fundamentals are the main driver. Ultimately, the author's problem is with speculators who they see as selling naked shorts as a way to artificially increase the supply of bullion in the futures market where price is determined. They get so close to the actual nub of the problem but miss it when they say, if purchasers of these shorts stood for delivery, the COMEX would fail. Now here's his refutation of that. He says, the fact is that the longs are as naked as the shorts. Both are using all their available money to fund their margin requirements so as to maximize their leverage so the shorts don't have the metal but the longs don't have the money. That is why delivery rates have always been so low on COMEX and there is nothing to indicate that this will change. You have gamblers on one side betting the price will go up versus gamblers betting it will go down. If there is any manipulation, one could argue that it is policy of low interest rates which encourage such excessive speculative behavior. Now this is such a subtle twist on the truth. It's amazing to me because we know that the left is going to blame the crash on speculation. So uh, that's a backhanded way of blaming capitalism. But let's look at the deception that's built into this argument that he makes here. He says, the longs are as naked as the shorts. Now let's think about that. What do the longs have to have? You're talking about a market to buy physical silver. So that means if someone's naked, that means that they don't have whatever they're offering to sell. Now in the case of the longs, they're offering to sell dollars and buy silver. Well, do the longs have any dollars in their accounts? Well, they don't have all the dollars. That's just what he's referring to. They don't have all the dollars in their accounts because it's margined. So they have their margin requirements. They have to put up a certain amount of dollars to be able to buy with another amount of dollars. In other words, they're borrowing money. So. They're not naked, they are margined. Now, what is the margin that the sellers have to put up? Remember, the buyers are buying silver and they're selling dollars. The sellers are selling silver and they're buying dollars. So if they're selling silver, they should have to put up a silver margin, right? They set to prove uh, that they have a certain amount of the silver they're willing to sell. Um, just the way that if you put up $50,000, that's some evidence that you can raise a million dollars. Well, if you're selling 50,000 ounces of silver, maybe you should have to put up 5,000 ounces of silver. But do they require them to put up silver to short silver? No. They require them to put dollars to short silver. So this is a ridiculous argument to say that the longs are as naked as the shorts. 
Now, there's no way, I, I guess there's a way this guy, this Braun Shuchecki could be this dumb. I don't think it's, I don't think he is that dumb. I mean, it's possible he's that dumb, but I think he's just a liar, really, honestly. He's a deceiver. And yet he works for the Perth Mint. He is, he's the John Nadler of the Perth Mint. Now that is shocking that you have somebody giving this disinformation that works for a mint. Now, why is that? Well, I've talked about that in the past. I don't, you know, I don't think the Perth Mint is in the business of trying to make money. I actually think the Perth Mint is in the business of trying to keep the Western system going. I think the Perth Mint actually is trying to keep from disgorging as much silver and gold, definitely silver, as, as they possibly can. And that's going to be the explanation for this type of attitude towards the thing that he's selling. You don't see people in business of selling something trying to convince their customers to not really buy it. And you don't see people selling something trying to make false arguments about the market for the thing that they're selling. And yet that's what you're seeing here. So this is a big, big fail by this gentleman. Um, it makes sense to me that the Perth Mint is trying to keep their silver and their gold on shore. And that's the reason why you have shortages. Uh, it doesn't make sense for Australia to part with its precious silver for prices as low as 15 to 20 dollars an ounce when they know it's worth a lot more than that so back to the silver chart i'm going to give a 80 percent chance that this is a secondary bottom and we're going to rally from here if not and we get lower prices that's going to be a better bargain because we're going to get more silver we'll talk to you next time